Anita May Knutson was born September 22, 1988, and was adopted at five months old by Gordon and Sharon Knutson. She attended school in California and even wrote and published a book while in the eighth grade. In 2002, she moved with her family to Butte, North Dakota, where she went to Velva High School. She was very active in school and graduated with honors in 2006. She was described as a tenacious, kind, and a passionate young woman, the type of person to defend someone being bullied or picked on and always stood up for what was right. At the age of 18, she had already completed her freshman semester at Minot State University, where she was majoring in elementary education. She had been working two jobs to pay for school, one at the Fairfield Inn as a housekeeper and the other working retail in the mall for vanity. She was living with a roommate in an off-campus apartment at 2420 4th Street Northwest in Minot, North Dakota. On June 4, 2007, her parents became concerned when they could not get in touch with her for three days. She also didn't show up for work. Gordon drove about an hour to her apartment to check on her, and when he arrived, her car was parked outside, but it seemed no one was home. The apartment was locked, so he found the landlady and the maintenance worker to ask for help. The maintenance worker said he had seen a sliced window screen lying on the ground that morning. When Gordon went to look for the screen, he realized it was from his daughter's bedroom window. He peered into Anita's bedroom window and saw his daughter lying face down in her bed. He reached in and touched her and realized she was gone. She had been stabbed to death and her body had been covered by a large house coat. Officers arrived and found a pocket knife with dried blood nearby. Her laptop, cell phone, purse with cash inside, and digital camera were all in her bedroom, proving that there had not been a robbery. Only four keys existed and belonged to the landlady, Laura Knapp, the maintenance worker, Marty Anel, Anita, and her roommate, Nicole. The police initially investigated two persons of interest, the maintenance worker and a fellow tenant in the building named Tyler. Tyler was an onlooker that day behind the crime scene tape and was known to have a crush on Anita. There were no signs that anyone had entered through Anita's bedroom window where the screen had been taken out. Traces of blood were found where the screen was cut, indicating it was probably sliced after the murder to stage the scene and mislead law enforcement. It didn't appear that anyone went through the window and nothing was disturbed beneath the window. It is also possible that after being sliced from the inside, the screen was pushed outwards onto the ground. Her autopsy revealed that she had not been sexually assaulted. Her time of death was determined to most likely be during the early morning hours of Sunday. But the last text message she replied to was close to 5 a.m. Saturday morning. This leads some to speculate that she could have been held hostage throughout all of Saturday. Police questioned Anita's friends, neighbors, and construction workers who were on a job nearby. They found traces of DNA on the pocket knife and took samples from the people they interviewed. Police also spoke to Anita's roommate, Nicole Rice. Nicole allegedly told police officers she was with her family all weekend. But investigators suspected something was off with Nicole's story. Statements given by Nicole and her parents were allegedly inconsistent and contradictory. Several friends told police that Anita and Nicole often fought and there was a lot of tension between the two girls. Not only that, but Nicole was known for having a very hot temper. One thing they didn't agree on was Nicole often having men over and then leaving them there while she went to school or work. Shockingly, Nicole's mother reportedly showed up to Anita's funeral and a verbal altercation occurred between her and Anita's mother. Nicole's mother was angry that her daughter had been questioned by police. Anita's mother stated that Anita was scared of rice. She had allegedly sent Anita threatening messages and Anita was planning on moving out. The police chief said investigators never ruled out Rice as a suspect, but they did not have enough evidence to arrest her initially. That was until the Oxygen Channel's Cold Justice took on the case and were able to obtain new information and get a break in the case. This led to the Minot Police Department re-interviewing suspects and witnesses earlier this year. 
Investigators received several tips about Rice, including one that said, while intoxicated, Rice told a former boyfriend that she did it. The man later tried to ask her about the confession when she was sober, but she allegedly got angry and refused to answer. It also states that Rice's statements and her family's statements about where she was the night of the murder were inconsistent. Rice said she was at her family's farm in Velva at the time, but a witness placed her at a bar in Russo on June 2, 2007, until the early morning of June 3. Nicole told a witness that after she left the club in Russo, she had to go to Minot to her apartment to get some clothes that night. The same witness said that Rice had changed her story multiple times and that she told her details about the crime scene that wouldn't have been known to anyone outside of the investigation team. Rice and her father previously told officers that she was at her parents' house from approximately 7 p.m. on Saturday, June 2nd, until the morning of June 4th, 2007. Those statements have changed several times and contradict each other. On March 16, 2022, Minot Police announced the arrest of 34-year-old Nicole Rice 15 years after the murder. Rice was arrested at Minot Air Force Base, where she worked as a civilian. She was taken to Ward County Jail and released the next day on a $120,000 cash bond paid by her father. In 2012, she pleaded guilty to two counts of issuing checks without sufficient funds. She did not appear in court or pay the fees and was charged with bail jumping. Authorities did not provide details on the evidence that pointed to Rice. As of now, Rice is due back in court April 21, 2022. Cynthia Cole was a loving mother described as having a kind and caring personality. Her friends described her as funny, upbeat, and fiercely loved the Lord, life, and the ocean. At the age of 57, she lived in Jensen Beach, Florida, and employed a handyman, 34-year-old Kiyoki Demich, to perform duties in and around her house for the past six years to help him financially. On Thursday, February 24, 2022, she was last seen at a community music and arts event known as the Jammin' Jensen in Jensen Beach. After the festival, her friends grew suspicious when they hadn't heard from her for several days. She was known to be a creature of habit and posted daily sunset pictures on her social media accounts and stayed in regular contact with her loved ones. Also, her friends did not see her 2015 gray Jeep Cherokee in front of her home as it usually was, and she didn't show up to a party on Friday, February 25th, or a doctor's appointment. She wasn't responding to texts and phone calls either, and so her friend Luann reported her missing. She told them that Cynthia did not have any mental health or addiction issues and wasn't depressed or suicidal. Deputies went to her house that same day and then the next. They also did not find her Jeep at the home, but they did find her purse inside along with her driver's license. It didn't appear that she had been home for some time. Meanwhile, her friend Luann pointed law enforcement to Cynthia's handyman, Kiyoki Demich. He had told Luann that Cynthia was supposed to pick him up on Saturday, February 26, but she never showed up. Cell phone records showed that she sent Demich a text around 2.40 a.m. on Friday, February 25th, saying, Hey, Key, sent you some money to finish the house off. I'll call you Saturday morning when I'm on my way. Location data also showed Cynthia was at her home late on Thursday, February 24th, and early the next day. Detectives spoke with Demich on March 2nd, and he agreed to hand over his phone. Investigators said they found a money transfer from Cynthia to Demich on Cash App at 3.46 a.m. on Friday, February 25th. But the text from her was not on his phone and appeared to have been deleted. During questioning, Demich told detectives that he often did work on her house on the weekends and that she paid him in cash, never via an app. He said the last time he saw her was on February 22nd when he was at her house inspecting her air conditioner. When detectives asked him about the missing text message, Demich allegedly claimed he lost his phone at a gas station on February 24th, adding that when he replaced it, his new phone did not show the text he missed in the interim. 
but he later changed his story, saying that he lost his phone while riding his bike on February 25th. He admitted to lying about the phone, and he stated that he lies often. Detectives began surveilling Demitch, and on March 4th, they found Cynthia's Jeep in a parking lot just walking distance from his home. Surveillance footage showed him walking multiple times towards and away from the area where the Jeep was located in the early morning hours of Friday, February 25th. According to reports, a subpoena for his Lyft account also showed that he ordered a car to her home around 7 p.m. on Thursday, February 24th, the day she was reportedly last seen. After finding her Jeep, detectives returned to her house to do another search. While there, they happened to notice that the cover to the septic tank was cracked open and didn't look right. Once opened, they could see a body. An all-consuming excavation ensued for many hours until Cynthia's body was located and recovered. An autopsy showed that she had suffered blunt force trauma to her head and abdomen and may have died of suffocation after being placed in the tank. After finding the body, detectives called Demitch back to the station where they questioned him again. He admitted to going to her house the night she disappeared and said he had driven her car to the parking lot. He was then arrested and charged with second-degree murder, but the motive is unclear. He was found guilty of failing to register with the DMV as a sex offender in St. Lucie Circuit Court a few years ago. On Christmas 2017, he posted on Facebook about losing a loved one, and Cynthia replied, Kiyoki, I'm so very sorry. I love you, and I'm here for you. Patricia Lorraine Barnes was born in Great Falls, Montana, and would later have two sons. She had lived in homeless shelters in the Pioneer Square neighborhood of Seattle, Washington. She was known as the Towel Lady because she usually wore a towel or bandana around her head to cover her hair, which was burned in an apartment fire. She bounced between shelters in Seattle and frequently stayed around the Pioneer Square area. On August 25, 1995, at the age of 61, her body was found in a ditch along Peacock Hill Road in Alala, Washington. She had died from a gunshot wound, but authorities reported that she apparently was killed elsewhere and her body moved to where she was ultimately found. At the time, it was believed she was another victim of the Spokane serial killer, later identified as Robert Lee Yates. However, he was excluded as a suspect after learning that he was stationed at Fort Rucker, Alabama at the time of her murder. It took detectives three days to identify Patricia through fingerprint records, which they had when she was convicted of a misdemeanor in Wenatchee several years ago. Roughly 130 pieces of evidence were collected, including DNA from a cigarette butt that was found near her. The same DNA was also found on her body and on items around her body, but detectives were unable to identify a suspect. Witnesses saw her with the man the day she was last seen and were able to provide enough details for a sketch to be created. Three days before she was found, she had a $300 check with her and had asked the director of Broadview Emergency Shelter to hold it for her, but the woman suggested Patricia go cash the check and deposit it in a bank. She was then seen in the downtown area with a white man in his 30s who was in the Seattle work release program, and the two told another man that they planned to go eat at Courthouse Park and then go to Federal Way. The case would then go cold for well over 20 years. The case would start to get attention again in April 2018 when the Cold Case Division of Kitsap County reopened it. In August 2020, DNA material was obtained via search warrant of a person of interest believed to be the last person in contact with Patricia. However, they were not a match and were excluded as a suspect. It was determined that the DNA found at the crime scene belonged to a single unidentified man, but when ran through the CODIS database, no match was found. The sheriff's office partnered with Othram, and within months, Othram scientists built a genealogical profile of the suspect and shared his information with authorities in December 2021. The name given was Douglas Keith Crone. However, he had died in 2016 in Arizona after he was electrocuted while installing some sort of TV antenna that hit power lines. 
a DNA sample collected in Crone's post-mortem exam was given to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, whose detectives compared it to the DNA samples recovered from the crime scene 26 years ago, and it was a match. Crone was an Army vet and convicted robber. He was 33 at the time of the murder and had addresses in both Seattle and Tacoma. He had an extensive criminal history in Washington in the 80s and 90s, including five felony convictions of first-degree robbery, second-degree kidnapping, and three others. Do you think justice was ultimately served? Let me know in the comments section below. Xu Ming Tang immigrated with his family from Taiwan to California to provide a better life for them. He owned and worked at a corner store, the Devonshire Little Store, on Devonshire Boulevard in San Carlos, California. On April 26, 1993, he was fatally shot while working at the store. A woman was seen leaving the store after the shooting and an apparent robbery gone wrong. Investigators knew that the suspect was described as a woman in her 20s with brown shoulder-length hair in a faded blue 1970s station wagon, but the case would go cold for 29 years. The case was reassigned in 2018, and San Mateo County Sheriff's detectives, crime analysts, and cold case investigators reviewed the investigation and identified a person of interest living in Washington County, Oklahoma, using advanced technology. On March 16, 2022, detectives arrested 61-year-old Raina Hoffman Ramos in Oklahoma for his murder. Detectives say Hoffman Ramos was a resident in San Mateo at the time of the murder but had moved to Oklahoma in recent years and has a criminal history. Police shared the news of the arrest with Tang's family. Hoffman Ramos was booked on a first-degree murder charge and police have not released what evidence led to her arrest. They did say, however, that she is believed to have acted alone. Chung's son, the current owner of Devonshire Little Store, bought the store from Tang's wife in July 1993. Sun immigrated to the U.S. from Taiwan with his son and daughter and said he was hoping to live in San Carlos to give his kids a good education. Between 1982 and 1985, in Shelby County, Indiana, a perpetrator was entering the homes of innocent victims with a mask on, armed with a gun or knife, and then forced the women at home to perform lewd sexual acts. In order to get the women to comply, he would threaten to hurt their children. In some of these cases, the females were home alone. In others, their husbands were home, with one man being tied up and beaten, resulting in permanent disabilities following a coma that lasted for months. At times, he forced couples to engage in acts and often took pictures. He even had the audacity to often ask for a Pepsi to drink. He always wore military-style boots and a ski mask. At least 10 victims came forward during these three years and reported rapes, including one mother and daughter. Although the perpetrator cautiously wiped down the scene and took items that he touched with him, he unknowingly left DNA behind at one of the crime scenes. It was sent in to Parabon Nanolabs for advanced DNA testing, and a profile was created resulting in a list of two possible suspects, the Hessler brothers. Further testing narrowed it down to Stephen Ray Hessler. Using an envelope that Hessler used to pay a utility bill in Greensburg where he lived, investigators were able to match his DNA to the DNA found at the crime scene. They then executed a search warrant at Hessler's residence in the early morning hours of August 17, 2020, and found a slew of evidence. Stolen photographs were found that were stolen from one victim and computers which showed that Hessler had been tracking down two other victims. 23 Polaroid pictures were found in a safe of couples that he had forced to perform acts. He had even downloaded a Google Earth Street View photo of one victim's house in Georgia. Also seized from Hessler's home were items used or seen during the attacks including a black coat, black gloves, a black ski mask, black military-style boots, chain-style wallets, knives, handcuffs and keys, a shoulder gun holster, multiple enema water bags, and jars of petroleum jelly that was used during each attack. 
All the items matched descriptions given by the victims in the 1980s attacks. The prosecution also pointed out hundreds of searches on Hessler's computers about the cases and the victims. Hessler spent 1990 to 1999 in an Indiana prison for a similar crime. In 1988, he entered a home at 3 a.m. with a gun while the man of the house was at work, forcing a woman to leave her child alone and walk barefoot through the streets and alleys to another home where he violated her. After trial in early 2022, Hessler was convicted of two counts of rape, six counts of unlawful deviant conduct, seven counts of burglary resulting in bodily injury, three counts of criminal deviant conduct, and one count of robbery, each as a Class A felony. Some victims bravely testified despite having received death threats during the attacks. 27 witnesses were called, and some had to be flown in from as far as Florida and Georgia, as well as a Secret Service computer technician from the East Coast. Hessler will be sentenced on April 1, 2022, and faces up to 50 years in prison for each count. <laughs>